So a lot of legendary coaches either lost their job or left their job last week, and I got to talk about it. First up, we're going to start with Pete Carroll because a lot of y'all had Pete Carroll fucked up for whatever reason. So before Nick Saban and Bill Belichick also left their jobs, Pete Carroll, we thought mutually part of ways to be part of the front office but then we saw the press conference and the interview he did afterwards and it seemed very clear this was not his choice the story from espn the exact quote is from b carroll and i quote the difficult part is if you guys could know it's really hard because there's not football people they're not coaches so to get the real details of it is really difficult for other people unquote he said that in references to what it will take to turn the seahawks around and it sounds like the people upstairs weren't trying to hear his reasoning as to what he could do to make the Seahawks get back to the prominence they were from their Super Bowl days. Here's why I say y'all got Pete Carroll fucked up at, because y'all try to act like he's not also a legendary coach. Pete Carroll is the winningest coach in the history of the Seattle Seahawks. He's the only person to win a Super Bowl for that franchise, which has been in existence since 1976. He is the first coach since 1992 and one of three coaches ever to win a national championship and a Super Bowl. You cannot tell the story of the NFL without talking about Pete Carroll and those Legion of Boom teams. In fact, I can argue that the Legion of Boom is the most iconic team of the 2010s that don't involve Tom Brady and Bill Belichick. And if you add in the college part of it, those USC teams were the NFL factory before Alabama came along. I have the numbers in front of me right here. 53 NFL picks, including Troy Polamalu, Reggie Bush, Carson Palmer, Clay Matthews, Mark Sanchez, just to name a few. So I feel pretty comfortable saying, yeah, he's a legend. He belongs in this conversation and he's definitely going to be in the Hall of Fame. And I know a lot of people want to bring up the fact that he has one or the second greatest Super Bowl blunder in the world with the uh, one yard line throwing the pass to Russell Wilson. To that I say, if we're going to reduce an entire career down to one call, we're going to have to empty out most of the Hall of Fame because there's a lot of times I can look at these people, these coaches, these players and say, all right, you did this, you got to go. What really made Pete Garrett so special was that he was the last quote unquote old guard coach. He's over 70. That was also a player's coach. He wasn't a disciplinarian the way Saban and Belichick are. He was able to get down and let his players be them and be fun in the press conferences and shit. Either this training camp or the year before, he was playing scout team quarterback and <laughs> running around throwing the ball, which is why I found it hard to believe that he was willingly leaving out the door in the first place. And it seems like I was correct in my assumption. Unfortunately, them young boys in his division has got to whoop in his ass. You can argue he's in the division with the two best coaches in football, Sean McVay and uh, Kyle Shanahan, both of which have been beating him like a drum. So if that's the case, then unfortunately, if you're Seattle, you got to move on. I was shocked when I first heard that they were moving on from Pete Carroll. But when you think about it, it makes sense. The important part is who's going to be the replacement. And everyone yelled straight to Dan Quinn. And even before the Cowboys game, that didn't make sense to me because if the goal is we got to compete with Shanahan, why would you go get the defense coordinator that Shanahan beat the dog shit out of earlier that season? That doesn't really make much sense, which is why I think the replacement is going to end up being Mike McDonald, the defense coordinator for the Ravens. That just makes too much sense. If the defensive downfall is what led you to fire Pete Carroll, which by all accounts, that's what it is. You go get the guy that's the head of the best defense in football. And the defense that proved on Christmas Day that they were able to stop a Kyle Shanahan offense. Makes sense to me. All right, now we got to get to Nick Saban. And we got to start with this Nike ad. And I'm going to put it here. I don't be giving free promo to people. Nike ain't paying me a goddamn dime for this. But it was so cold, I got to mention it. For y'all that are listening, it says... The college football world hasn't slept this well in years when they're announcing Nip Saban's retired. And let me say, not only is that cold, it is insanely fitting. I'm going to read off some of these accomplishments by Nick Saban real quick. And I know we think we know, but I, it's different when it's in front of you. <clears throat> he has won 10 games a year minimum every year at Alabama, except his first one. So that is 16 out of 17 years. He has won six national titles, nine SEC titles. This past season was the longest gap between national championships for the Alabama Crimson Tide. 
That gap is three years. So from 2006, every two years, you can set your watch to it. Alabama's winning a national championship. This is a level of accomplishment excellence you will never see again. Alabama was the NFL factory for the 2010s. And it's the way that he turned into an NFL factory. I was listening to him in an interview recently. Can't remember where it's from. Not important. Well, he was talking about how he's preparing his players for the draft now, including uh, educating them on agents and particularly important with the way NIL is working. Now, a lot of these kids are getting duped by these agents, by the way. That's I'm going to do a whole podcast about why we actually need to add some structure to this NIL shit. And has nothing to do with the colleges. That has something to do with protecting these children from getting robbed by these people. But we'll get there later. Getting draft grades for all his draft eligible players from 25 different NFL teams minimum. Inviting NFL scouts to watch them at practice so even players that don't get a chance to play in as many games can still get NFL looks. And that's before you even factor in the NFL level training regimen and schedule that he has these kids on from the second they step foot in Tuscaloosa. Multiple coaches on his staff, including himself, that have NFL background, so they're just able to educate these kids every single step of the way. Which is why in the Nick Saban era, read this on Spot Track. 123 NFL draft picks that made a combined 2.26 billion dollars throughout the course of their career. Now, I'm in my uh reaction video to when he first retired, I made a joke. I was like, how much money y'all think Nick Saban uh generated for the black community? And I was gonna do the math by going through every draft year and just weeding out the black people and their career earnings. But thankfully, Spot Track did a lot of that work for me. Thank you, Spot Track. And after that, I decided I'm just gonna estimate. So the NFL is roughly 56% black. Not to say 56% of the players saving sense of the league are black, but we'll use that number for now. So 56% of 2.26 million is roughly 1.265 billion. Sheesh. <laughs> oh, from 2006 to 2024. So over the course of 17 years, over a billion dollars generated in the black community, roughly. The government ain't got shit on Nick Saban, boy. Let me tell you. Put Nick Saban in charge of reparations, goddammit. We'll get some change overnight. We may finally get that 40 acres and a mule. Nick Saban was all about getting these players paid. And he was able to win. So the point where the whole Bryant bank conspiracy exists and we make our jokes about him giving the players Hellcats when they signed to Alabama. Ha ha ha. Which is why I didn't understand why everyone tried to blame the NIL landscape on why Nick Saban wanted to retire. He was doing just fine recruiting wise. They have the number two recruiting class in the country coming in next year. That number might drop now. Depending on how Kalen DeBoer, we'll get to him in a second, is able to handle this. He, did he have complaints about the structure of the way NIL was working? Of course, because it's a fucked up wild, wild west right now with no order, no CBA, no nothing. If you've heard this podcast, you've heard me get on my soapbox about why the way college football is set up is fucked up right now. But we'll get there later. Not important. But the main people I saw that were trying to use this point that NIL is what drove Nick Saban and other old guard coaches out of college football were the people who usually complain about the way NIL and transfer portals are quote unquote ruining the sport. And y'all are just upset about players getting paid because for years and years and years, you've been able to enjoy a form of football where the players aren't richer than you and are getting exploited for their labor. And that just made you more comfortable. And now that's not the case. Nick Saban did not share that opinion with you. You cannot be a person that joked that Alabama was paying for players and also think that because people with players are now getting paid, that's why Nick Saban wants to retire. Why is it so hard to believe that the 71-year-old man was just sick of it and is tired of going on recruiting trips all the time and doesn't want to be in the bumfuck Louisiana trying to recruit a defensive tackle at the age of 71 years old? That's not so hard to believe. Come on now. But in essence, Nick Saban's legacy is one that can't really be duplicated or followed up on, but that didn't stop Kalen DeBoer from trying. The head coach of the once in the national championship, national championship runner up Washington Huskies, Kalen DeBoer decided to leave his comfort of Seattle to go on down to Tuscaloosa and be the follow up to Nick Saban. Now, if you noticed, he's not from the Saban coaching tree. Like there's 30 other coaches in the college football world that are off the Saban coaching tree. 
and none of them took the job because they're not dumb enough to do so. And if you met Dabo Sweeney, you know that that threshold is high. The line between dumb and irrational confidence is very slim, and we're going to judge whether Kalen DeBoer is one or the other based on the results. But the headline from this article on Deadspin kind of sealed the deal, and it kind of reiterates my point, and it also made me laugh. Does Kayla DeBoer know what he's getting into at Alabama? New Crimson Tide head coach's opportunity of a lifetime. That's a direct quote from him. We'll take eight lifetimes to live up to. Now, I think Kayla DeBoer is a damn good coach. Obviously, he was able to make the national championship with Washington, who hasn't been good in my lifetime. Apparently, they were good in the early 90s, 80s or whatever. Cool. They weren't good when I was alive. But there's a couple things that might get in the way of that. Number one, SEC country is very skeptical of quote-unquote outsiders. Somebody called into Paul Feinbaum's show. I wasn't actually listening to the show. I saw the clip on Twitter, so I may butcher a few things. And called him a Yankee and said he wasn't a part of the union and wouldn't have fought with the union. For y'all that are unfamiliar with the union, that's what racist Southerners called the Confederacy that are fighting to uphold slavery in the Civil War. That's what they're calling the union. (laughs) So basically, He's being judged because he wasn't part of a Confederate state and wouldn't have fought for slavery. That's an extreme example, but Southerners are not very kind to non-Southerners, especially when they try to fake the funk. But I will give him credit for not doing the Brian Kelly thing and trying to put on the fake Southern accent, not going down and saying program instead of program and saying family or family or whatever the hell Brian Kelly did in his first press conference instead of saying family like he actually talks. But that is going to make recruiting a little bit difficult for him because you know that's a card that these that these Southern uh, head coaches are going to try to pull on him and be like, eh, he don't get us the way I do and shit like that. So uh, we'll see, Kalen. Good luck. <laughs> Good luck, buddy. All right, last but most certainly not least, Bill Belichick parted ways with the New England Patriots, and you want to talk about a swing of emotions, because just last week, as I was recording this podcast, the Tuesday night, the podcast comes out Wednesday morning. That Tuesday night, I said, I don't know what's going on with Belichick. My first choice has always been to keep him. Always. I didn't want this to happen. However, I was incredibly happy when we got to the replacement. We'll get to drop mail in a minute. There is a reason I'm saving him for last. (laughs) So from the absolute lowest of lows of losing the head coach, the only one I've ever known, Bill Belichick has been the head coach of the Patriots for 24 of the 27 years of my life. So for all intents and purposes, I don't know anyone other than Bill Belichick as the coach. And for that, I know that I have been incredibly spoiled. The Patriots have always been near at the bottom of the league in terms of penalties. I don't see undisciplined football on a weekly basis. I've never went into a game and thought the other team had a coaching advantage, ever. I never thought my team was going to go out there and look unprepared. And what really sealed the deal for me that how successful the Patriots were throughout my life really started at home was when we lost that Super Bowl to the Eagles and I saw Philly fans destroy their entire city because they were so happy they won for the first Super Bowl in their entire career. Careers fans. At that point, the Patriots were five rings in? I always forget which Super Bowl came first between the Eagles and the Falcons. But see, that's my point. I won so many Super Bowls in my life that I can't even keep track of them all. Meanwhile, the Eagles could tell you to the very second of the very day of the very year that they won that Super Bowl. And just to me, 24 years as a head coach, 10 Super Bowl appearances, you kind of take that for granted sometimes. That shit's not normal. And even towards the end, we still didn't have those issues where I thought we were going to get outcoached and we were going to go out there and be undisciplined and unprepared. We were outmanned. (laughs) We were not as talented as other teams were playing, which is why we ended up having the record we did, which for most coaches wouldn't be a problem. But Bill Belichick was also choosing the men, which is why ultimately this relationship had to end. And I know the inevitable Brady versus Belichick debate had to just keep going on and on and on. And for someone who lived through the entire Brady Belichick run, here's the actual answer. If anyone says that Brady was the thing that levitated this and kept it together the entire time, clearly you do not remember the Patriots pre-2007. Those first three Super Bowls where Brady wasn't Tom Brady yet and didn't make the jump to absolute game changer yet and was still managing games and the team was still led by its defense, 
those were all Belichick. Not saying that any quarterback could have been inserted and taken over Brady. Obviously, I'm not here to discredit Tom Brady at all. He's the goat of goatiest of goats of all goats. But to sit here and say Belichick had nothing to do with three out of the six Super Bowls they won is utter and complete bullshit. Even Brady credits Belichick in their weekly meetings for expanding his understanding of opposing defenses, which was Tom Brady's strength the way he understood opposing defenses. So it is a synergy that they were able to work together. My favorite concept of team dynamics is something my head coach told me in high school. He said, if I rip you or one of the coaches rip you, we got to make sure we got another person on the staff to patch you back up so I don't lose you forever. That's how every organization is based. Sports, business, whatever. Some way, shape, or form a structure of disciplinarian, team motivator, person able to patch shit back up. Rip guy, patch guy. Bill Belichick was the rip guy. Brady was the patch guy. The very promo for the uh, Patriots Dynasty documentary that's coming out in February on Apple TV, which I'll be watching every single second of, obviously. I might do a whole recap podcast about it. Amendola said specifically, we worked for Belichick, we played for Brady. That's essentially the same damn thing. Bill's the boss, Tom's our leader. <laughs> because Tom's the guy who after Bill finished motherfucking you in the middle of the uh, in the middle of the film room and tells you all everything you've done wrong and somebody at Foxborough High School could run that route better than you and blah 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 Tom Brady can come up behind him and be like hey man put the arm around you hey man it's okay and because it's Tom fucking Brady you're taking his word as gospel <laughs> and him motivating you hits very differently and the fact that he's getting motherfucked too allows belichick to be able to give it to everyone else on the roster because if tom brady ain't saying shit about it who the fuck do you think you are to say something about it anyways i got a little got a little too hyped up towards the end of that my bad it's just the brady belichick debate always pissing me off the greatest run for any head coach and quarterback ever and you try to prescribe it to one or the other you don't do that to any of the other runs but the one that's better than everyone else's <laughs> you think is only responsible for one man even though one man has not been able to do it in the entire 100 years history of the NFL. It makes no fucking sense. Anyways, in summary on the Belichick point, I am forever grateful for Bill Belichick. I will never be able to bring myself to root against Bill Belichick, no matter who the hell he coaches for, whether it's the Cowboys, the Falcons, and my dumbass. Last week when I was doing the uh, end of season recap, I said the Falcons were the best available job and any coach should be jumping at the opportunity to take it just for them to interview Bill Belichick over the weekend. Just of because of course unless they're playing my patriots i'm gonna root for them to win every single game wherever belichick ends up i also realized that what bill belichick accomplished is incredibly unrealistic to expect anyone else to duplicate